Do you see them? Okay. So this is a 61 year old man. He has, he's no past medical history. He's coming really with anasarca, massive ascites, peripheral edema, JVD, and uh, maybe 30, 40 pounds weight gain. So this is, uh, you know, as Dr. Ross, Rossen mentioned in the past, you see somebody with this picture of predominant right heart failure. It could be right heart failure, but also thinks of two other differential constriction and restrictive cardiomyopathy. So this is a simultaneous recording in this patient of left ventricle and right ventricle. This is a single most important recording when you're considering that differential diagnosis, okay? So um, I want you to look at this pressure tracing and see what you think of it. And what's, what's the single most important uh, measurement to look at in, on, this page, uh, on, on this recording? What's the single most important feature to look at when you have this recording? So uh, that's fine, I'm going to speak. So the single most important one is to look for concordance and discordance of systolic pressures. So the single most important thing to look at is systolic pressures, okay? The systolic pressure of the LV and the systolic pressure of the RV. Second more important is to analyze diastole for equalization of diastolic pressure. But the single most important thing is the systolic and a systolic variation in pressures. So I want you to look at this and see, let me pick on uh, somebody here. Um, let's see. Let's say uh, Lakshmi, if you hear me, look at that. And I want to tell you, what do you think there is? I'll, I'll, I'll ask you to answer this. Does, does this patient have systolic concordance or discordance of the pressures? I think there's concordance of the pressures. Okay, so here as well, I'll explain to you something. So when we say systolic concordance versus discordance, the big idea is that we're looking to see whether the pressures of the RV and LV move in the same direction with respiration, okay? Meaning in inspiration, both the LV and RV pressures decline. In expiration, both the LV and RV pressures rise. That is concordance. Discordance means they move in opposite direction and it suggests constrictive pericarditis. It's highly specific for constrictive pericarditis. And that's what we would be looking for. The catch though, is that you should not analyze the peaks. So if you look at the peaks of the pressures, look here, uh, Lakshmi and other fellows. So the systolic pressure of the right ventricle seems to be rising while the systolic peak of the left ventricle maybe seems to be rising too, or it's hard to tell. At initial look, it seems that they are concordant. So, you know, I understand your impression. So it seems they are concordant. They move in the same direction. But the way you analyze behavior of the ventricles and concordance versus discordance is to not look at the peak pressure. You have to look at area under the curve. Okay, so you have to compare the pulse volume, the pulse volume of the ventricle versus that of the LV. That's what correlates to the stroke volume, the area under the curve, not the peak. And so that's one important idea. You compare the pulse volume in, in inspiration versus expiration. Second important idea is that you need to find what is inspiration, what is expiration. How do you define which beat is inspiration? The easiest way is to look at the diastolic dips. Peak inspiration corresponds to the lowest diastolic dip. That is, so whenever you have the lowest diastolic dip, this here, the beat that follows it is the peak inspiratory beat. Then you look at the highest diastolic uh, dip. The highest diastolic dip, something like those two, this corresponds to expiration. Okay, so this is inspiration, this is expiration. Then you compare on those two beats, the area under the curve, the pulse volume. So on this beat, this is the right ventricle, this is the left ventricle. 
And here I'll show you. On that beat, this is the right ventricle and left ventricle. So look, the right ventricle is actually shrinking in expiration, even though the pressure, the systolic pressure seems to be rising, but the pulse volume is actually shrinking while the LV pulse volume is actually expanding. So you do have systolic discordance. You have actually pronounced discordance. Yet uh, even the doctor, you know, um, some doctors who look at this, actually, I know this case thought it is concordant, not just fellows. So be careful. You have to look at that. This patient has a prominent systolic discordance, actually. And he did have constrictive pericarditis. OK. Does everybody understand that? The two features, you have to look at the pulse volume, not the peaks, and you have to pick the, to make it easy, pick the peak inspiratory beat and peak expiratory beat based on the diastolic dips that help you tell which one is the peak uh, inspiratory and expiratory beats. Now, another thing I want to highlight is a diastolic equalization. So that is the second feature you look at when you're looking at those tracing. Now, diastolic equalization, meaning in end diastole, the RV and LV are superimposed. They don't have to be superimposed. They do not superimpose throughout the cardiac cycle. They typically superimpose at one portion of the cardiac cycle. Here they are superimposing in inspiration. Then the LV becomes bigger than the RV in expiration. You see here they separate, but they are equal in inspiration. This feature is supportive of constrictive pericarditis. You do get end diastolic pressure equalization with constrictive pericarditis. However, it is non-specific. You may see it in RV failure. You may see it in restrictive cardiomyopathy. So it's not a specific feature. Typically in RV failure and restrictive cardiomyopathy, they are, you, go, you do get end diastolic equalization but when they separate, it's usually the RV that is higher than the LV, not the LV higher than the RV. So the fact that LV higher than RV here is also suggestive of constriction. But again, endocytic equalization is not specific. Uh, this is what you should look for, the systolic discordance. Did everybody understand that? I'll explain more the mechanism, but I do want you to see my idea. This is what you look for, the bulk. Some Mayo calls it the systolic area index. That's what it is, it's that pulse volume comparison. All right, now here I want to explain the mechanism. The mechanism are a little bit uh, complicated, but I do want you to focus here. I want you to try to understand that. So, there are at least a couple of important consequences that happen in constrictive pericarditis. One, you have a very constrictive, stiff shell surrounding the heart. The myocardium is fine, but it's constricted by a stiff shell. That stiff shell leads to two major consequences. One, it prevents the ventricles from expanding outward. Normally, the ventricles expand when they fill outward, not so much at the expense of each other. But when you have that constrictive shell, the ventricles have to expand at the expense of each other, and that is called ventricular interdependence, OK? So that's one important consequence. So they have to fight each other for space. And as a consequence, they equalize in pressure in diastole. They, they get forced to push the, each other out and equalize with the pressure of the surrounding shell. Okay, that's equalization of diastolic pressure. They become equal to that pericardial constricting pressure. A second consequence that, uh, that you need to know, I think most people don't know it, is that there is what we call the inspira, let's say in inspiration, you get negative pressure in the thorax, okay? That gets transmitted to the extra cardiac structures. However, that shell prevents the transmission of the negative inspiratory pressure to the actual cardiac chambers. And this is unusual. We normally have that transmission, as you may see it when we're doing hemodynamic recordings. And this is what we call dissociation between intrathoracic and intracardiac respiratory transmission, okay? So that's a very important feature. And that actually explains the discordance. And that's why it's so important. Those, those two processes, ventricular interdependence and dissociation of 
transmission of respiratory pressure explain ventricular interdependence. So some of you think that ventricular interdependence, that the discordance is due to the fact that in inspiration, you get more filling of the right side, it compresses the left side. So the right side increases, the left side uh, decreases in flow. That explanation works in tamponade. In constriction, the process is a little bit different. And I do want you to understand it, just to understand mechanism here. In constriction, the process is a little different. So here's the process. It starts on the left side, the process, not on the right side. So in inspiration, you do get transmission of negative pressures, but you don't get it to the, to the, to the heart. So what happens on the left side the LA pressure doesn't change in inspiration, whereas the pulmonary venous and the lung pressures decline. So the gradient between the pulmonary vein, venous return, pulmonary venous return, and the left atrium declines, as you see here. So the flow on the left side will decline. And as such, the left side will suck the right side. So the left side flow declines first, and that will suck the RV and suck right-sided flow. You understand? As a result, the right heart will suck from the IVC. What happens, the IVC is an abdominal structure. So uh, it, it will be, so when the, when the right heart sucks flow, it will suck from the IVC, okay? It is a little different from the SVC, and that explains another mechanism in constriction. The SVC and IVC are different in constrictive pericarditis. The SVC is a thoracic structure. Therefore, the inspiratory pressure gets transmitted to it. And as such, there is a reduced gradient between SVC and RA because the RA is still unchanged. So you get reduced paradoxically, unlike normal individuals, the SVC to RA flow declines with inspiration because of that. No RA change, SVC declines. And this is what explains the fact that the SVC and JVP pressure does not decline with inspiration in constrictive pericarditis. This is what we call the Kuzmol sign, okay? Which is indirectly the RA pressure does not decline with inspiration in constrictive pericarditis. That's the Kuzmol sign. RA pressure doesn't decline. This gradient actually declines and therefore the flow between SVC and RA tends to decline. Conversely, IVC being outside the thorax, it doesn't get exposed to that negative pressure and it gets sucked in by the LV, which sucks the RV, RA, IVC. You got it? So IVC flow increases, whereas SVC flow does not increase. There is dissociation between SVC and IVC in constrictive pericarditis. I hope you understood that. It's a little bit complicated but I hope you understand it. The opposite happens in expiration where it's the pressures are positive and the reverse happen. The left side expands, the pulmonary vein to LA flow increases, LV increases, pushes the RV, which shrinks flow from the IVC. Um, okay, and the SVC pressure here rises. So you do get some increased flow between the SVC and RA. Did everybody understand that uh, mechanism of constrictive pericarditis? Well, um, yeah, it was clear, clear pretty clear. But, uh, okay. pretty sure All right, that. thank you. So I will move forward. So what does this explain that mechanism? Those mechanisms I explained, they translate into two things hemodynamically. One is that we have marked respiratory variation in flow between the right heart and the left heart and the flow translates into systolic pressures and especially systolic area curve, area pressures, pulse volumes on recording. So this is the, one of what we see. On echo, this explains what we call the respiratory variation of E wave that you see, but more importantly, the respiratory variation of hepatic vein flow. This is the IVC flow variation which is the hepatic vein flow variation, which I will go over a little later. So this is the uh, landmark uh, characteristic of constrictive pericarditis, respiratory variation in flow 
or systolic areas. Same on echo. Another landmark finding in constrictive pericarditis is that diastolic pressures do not change. So systolic pressure vary dramatically, while diastolic pressures do not change much. And that's the Kuzmol sign, OK? So you'll see the JVP, but also the RA pressure does not change much because of that lack of direct pressure transmission to it in inspiration, OK? Another thing here I will highlight, it's an interesting finding, is from the same patient, you can see here, uh, again, uh, the respiratory variation in flow and pulse volume. I want to highlight the PVC. I like PVCs in constrictive pericarditis. They are not much talked about, but I do like them. Because here's the thing, when you have constrictive pericarditis, the same thing, way respiration affects flow between uh, flow behavior on both sides of the ventricle, on both sides of the septum, same thing happens with the PVC. Normally when you have a PVC, both ventricle, post PVC, both ventricles will have expanded outward and both ventricles will increase their flow to a varying degree, depending on the stroke volume reserve and preload reserve of each ventricle. However, in constrictive pericarditis, both ventricle cannot expand simultaneously. One would expand, but the other has to shrink. So it tends to exaggerate that discordance. You're allowing when one ventricle to fill excessively and compress the other ventricle excessively. So I like that post-PVC behavior. It can exaggerate the respiratory discordance. So here you have a PVC and post PVC. If you compare the pre to post, you can see that marked discordance. This is the RV before, this is the RV after, whereas the LV is much shrunk after a PVC. In a way, it exaggerated, it, that PVC occurred in inspiration and it exaggerated that inspiratory discordance. It made it even much more pronounced, okay? So I just wanted to highlight that point. I will jump to another tricky point here. Also to explain mechanism, it will get more difficult, unfortunately, but I hope you can review those and it can make sense. So tamponade. Tamponade is, has very similar hemodynamics to constriction with slight differences, okay? The Tamponade, in tamponade, you're, both ventricles are also constrained. Both, sorry, all four chambers are constrained by the pericardium. They are actually more constrained than in constrictive pericarditis because you have that more uniform compression by the fluid in that pericardium. So actually they are more constrained. You actually get more ventricular interdependence and more respiratory variation in flow and constriction. Actually, that's why on physical exam, this respiratory discordance between RV and LV flow, this is what causes in, in, in one manifestation on it on physical exam is pulses paradoxes. And pulses paradoxes is far more common in tamponade. It's almost universal in tamponade, while it's relatively less common in constrictive pericarditis. O only a third of patients have constrictive pericarditis. It's because to get it on exam, you need to have more pronounced discordance. So tamponade has actually even more pronounced RV-LV discordance than constrictive pericarditis. There is a catch though, the mechanism in tamponade is a little bit different. And we don't usually do simultaneous recording in tamponade because it's more a clinical and echo diagnosis. But the mechanism in tamponade is a little different. I want to highlight it. In tamponade, that you don't have a stiff shell. You have a lot of water constrictive, but it's not a stiff shell. So actually respiratory pressure gets transmitted to the intracardiac chamber. So we see here, they are not zero, unlike that other. Here, I kept it as zero, no transmission of pressure. Whereas here you do get, in tamponade, you do get transmission of negative pressure and inspiration. So, so actually the mechanism is a little different. So that the mechanism that you know, it works in tamponade, meaning in inspiration, you get negative pressure on the right heart, it will suck flow from outside the chest. The right heart expands. The constrictive shell this time does not allow the RV to expand outward, so it pushes the LV, and therefore you get that discordance. 
but the mechanism is different. It's, it's more the RV sucking blood and pushing the LV versus the LV getting sucked and sucking everything else. I like, I think it's important to understand that. And there are also a couple of implications of that. One, you don't have Kuzmol sign in tamponade. Kuzmol sign is more constrictive pericarditis and some other illnesses, but not tamponade. Tamponade, the JVP does decline. The RA pressure does decline with inspiration. There is uh, one more difference between constrictive and uh, Tamponade, I think it's a very important difference. In constrictive pericarditis, I didn't talk much about the RA pressure, but the RA pressure in constrictive pericarditis does dip, so it doesn't change much, the RA pressure with the inspiration, but it does dip in early diastole. You do get deep Y in constriction. You do get deep Y in constrictive pericarditis. It does dip in early diastole, whereas and then, and then it becomes a steady state. I'll show you some pictures. Whereas in tamponade, there is so much uniform compression, even more intense and more uniform than in constriction, that actually you do not get, get any diastolic dip in pressure, okay? Or any diastolic feeling of the RA. So the Y descent is a flat, okay? You don't get any diastolic flow in that RA. So the Y descent is a flat because there is no flow. The pressure declines overall, but the Y does not dip. In constriction, the pressure doesn't decline, but the Y dips. I'll go over maybe some pictures to illustrate. This is, the, uh, this is an illustration of a, of a tamponade. So again, to, to, to summarize it, a tamponade has a lot of similar, similarities with constriction. It's just a different mechanism of discordance, okay? It's more, uh, again, there is a transmission of respiratory pressure, so it's a different mechanism of discordance. Second, there is no Kuzmol sign. Third, there is more uniform compression of the cardiac chambers, which explain lack of any Y, and it also explains a more pronounced discordance, therefore more pulses paradoxes. And those are the three differences here, I, I highlighted them. This is an example of a patient. This is an RA pressure. It's a simultaneous RA pressure with something else hugging it. Can you guess what is this something else hugging the RA pressure equal to it? What structure will hug the RA pressure will behave exactly like it in tamponade. I'll make it easy here. It actually defines tamponade. This tracing defines tamponade. It's the pericardium, okay? This is tamponade. This is pericardial pressure recording along with RA pressure recording. By definition, the hemodynamic definition of tamponade, the most direct hemodynamic definition is RA pressure and pericardial pressure are equal are elevated and equal. That's the equalization of pressure. All chambers become equal to the pericardial pressure in diastole. More specifically, the RA pressure becomes equal to the pericardium almost throughout the cardiac cycle. So, so this is a simultaneous recording of pericardial and RA pressure, again, superimposed in tamponade by definition. Notice the lack of Y descent. You have a pronounced X descent in tamponade like you do in constriction, but you do have that early systolic filling, but you do not get any diastolic filling because of that uniform cardiac compression. They cannot, the right atrium cannot expand at all in diastole. So you get that flat Y, no Y dip at all. Look, it's flat, nothing here, okay? So you get A, V, and A, almost no Y, a fast, okay? And I want you to remember that they do ask it on board. They even ask it on my interventional board. So always remember that flat Y tamponade, F, Y, T, flat Y tamponade, very important. Now, this is what happened after pericardiocentesis. What is the normal pericardial pressure? Can anybody tell me what's on you, for example? What's your normal pericardial pressure? Anybody knows? 
Anybody can guess? Like five? No. Usually negative. Very good answer. Yes, negative. That's the normal pericardial pressure. Normal pericardial pressure is like respiratory pressure. It's negative and it reaches positive in end expiration. So actually any positive pericardial pressure is already a sign of pericardial disease. And it becomes tamponade when that pericardial pressure equalizes with the RA pressure, okay? But even before it equalizes, positive pericardial pressure is a hint to a future progression to tamponade, okay? It's already abnormal and it's already pericardial disease. So look at this patient after we did pericardiosynthesis and it's nice to do those recording. I mean, we can do them systematically. It's not hard to do. Uh, I always do pericardial pressure for sure on all patients at the onset of the case and at the end of the case. So pericardial pressure became negative. RA pressure became normal. So here is what I want to tell you. Are there cases where after pericardiosynthesis one or either of those two does not uh, normalize. Anybody knows? Any case you know of where we do pericardiosynthesis, you drain the fluid. On echo, there is no more fluid at all. Yet somehow the RA pressure is still high and or the pericardial pressure is still above zero. Is it effusive constrictive pericarditis? Yes, very good. It's effusive constrictive pericarditis. Effusive constrictive pericarditis means essentially you have constrictive pericarditis with a fluid and it can fool you and the fluid will aggravate the hemodynamics of constrictive pericarditis. It may fool you into thinking this is tamponade, but in reality, the main uh, process is constriction and you add a fluid that further increases pericardial pressure and further aggravate the constrictive manifestations. And that's what effusive constrictive is. About 50, in a Cleveland Clinic uh, registry, about 15% of tamponade that you drain are effusive constrictive pericarditis. So it's not rare at all. So be on the look for it, okay? In that case, the most important definition is that the RA pressure doesn't decline despite sucking the fluid dry. Uh, another definition, not always present, is that the pericardial pressure does not decline to normal. It may or may not remain equal to the RA pressure, but it does not decline to normal. So when either of those two does not decline to normal, think of effusive constrictive pericarditis, okay? So I mentioned constrictive pericarditis and I mentioned tamponade. Uh, and I mentioned effusive constrictive pericarditis. Oftentimes you don't have to differentiate constrictive pericarditis from tamponade because one is acute, the other is chronic. Tamponade is acute, constrictive pericarditis is chronic. The bigger differential diagnosis of constrictive pericarditis are those two. I picked those two to make it easy. So, and actually the most common differential diagnosis, everybody thinks of restrictive cardiomyopathy. By far the most common mimicker of constrictive pericarditis is severe RV failure and or severe tricuspid regurgitation. This is the most common mimicker. All three clinical diagnoses will have similar clinical picture. JVD, basically a picture of right heart failure, ascites, severe peripheral edema. So how do you distinguish them? Uh, here's the thing, in restrictive cardiomyopathy, it's kind of easier to explain uh, you know, there are a couple of things. In restrictive cardiomyopathy, you don't have, I'll use this, uh, maybe this, uh, you don't have that constrictive shell. The ventricles can expand outward. So you do not have ventricular interdependence. Second, in restrictive cardiomyopathy, you do get uh, transmission of the respiratory pressure to the cardiac chambers, okay? So for those reasons, um, Typically in restrictive cardiomyopathy, you do not have you do not have discordance of flow between the right and left sided fillings simply because they can expand outward. There is no ventricular interdependence. Okay. Another thing that's very important in restrictive cardiomyopathy is that typically, unlike constrictive pericarditis, the right and left heart are have limited preload reserve. 
meaning and inspiration and expiration, their feeling is not going to change much because they are, they are not going to accept much. They are restricted. So they don't get respiratory variation in flow regardless because again, they don't have much preload reserve. They cannot fill that much anyway. They are too stiff. So that's one thing that explains also that you don't have respiratory discordance between the LV and RV. Their pressure move concordantly and they are more subject to the direct pressure. So you get an inspiration negative pressure, both LV and RV go down because of that direct negative effect of the pressure on the catheter measurement. Positive pressure and expiration, they go up simultaneously. Also, the pressures are not forced to equalize. So you do not have to have equalization, although equalization is relatively common, but it's less common than constricted pericarditis, equalization in diastole. In RV failure, it's more interesting. RV failure is a form of severe RV failure with RV dilatation is a form of what you call functional constriction. Because what happens when your RV enlarges dramatically, okay, it will stretch that pericardium. And when it, stretch, when it stretches that pericardium, the pericardium cannot stretch anymore. Then the RV starts to have to expand at the expense of the LV. So severe RV dilatation is a form of functional constrictive pericarditis. So you do get ventricular interdependence. You do get equalization of diastolic pressure. In diastole, they push each other to, till they equalize because they cannot expand outwards. So you do get equalization of diastolic pressure and you do get ventricular interdependence. The RV press, pressures the LV. Yet, interestingly, you do not get discordance of pressure. And here is why. So you do get functional constriction, but discordance of pressure means in inspiration, one ventricle is filling at the expense of the other ventricle. That's what discordance means. In inspiration, like I showed in that prior uh, here, inspiration, this is filling a lot more than the LV. So you get more flow here and the flow shrinks in the LV. You get discordance of pressures. But in RV failure, you do not have that simply because that RV in inspiration, that RV is so distended already, it has like a restrictive cardiomyopathy, like in any heart failure, advanced heart failure, you have very limited preload reserve. So that RV is not going to fill more with inspiration, okay? Therefore, it's not going to compress the LV more. Therefore, you don't get much respiratory flow variation, believe it or not. So you get ventricular uh, interdependence that is not very much subject to respiratory variation. That's kind of the difference between constrictive pericarditis and the functional constriction you get in right heart failure. So again, another thing, RV is on the flat portion of the Starling curve. So therefore, even if you increase its preload, you don't increase its preload, but even if you do, it's not gonna increase its flow because of the stroke volume preload relationship is a flat. You're not gonna increase the flow. That's the reason you don't get discordance. Okay, actually, I want to go back to this and tell you one thing on this tracing. The fact that you have such a dramatic variation in RV, look at that RV volume, even without looking at respiratory variation. Just this RV is big here, is so small here. The fact that you have so much respiratory variation in pulse volume tells you that it's highly unlikely you have right heart failure here. It's highly unlikely that you have restrictive cardiomyopathy. You have too much variation in stroke volume. Therefore, too much of a preload reserve. And therefore, you're not also on a flat portion of Starling curve. So it's unlikely that you have um, a right heart failure or constrictive pericarditis. That's another feature. I hope you understood. I know it's complex. I'm going to give you any questions. All right, I'm going to give you a case here. This is a 50 year old obese woman she presents with anasarca again and JVD. So a right heart catheterization is performed and I want you to know, tell me what's the diagnosis. So this is her PA pressure, okay? PA pressure, you can say 
fluctuates with the respiration. She's obese. Keep in mind, obese people get a lot of respiratory variation because they generate deep respiratory pressures. We don't like uh, generation of deep respiratory pressure. The only time we like it is when we, when we record. The only time in hemodynamics we like to take deep breath during our recording is when we're recording LV and RV simultaneous pressures. That's about the only time. Otherwise, we don't like it, the deep breath, okay? Uh, it just creates too much uh, of a direct effect of the negative pressure on your catheter measurement. And it, you know, we like the respiratory pressures to be zero to measure the true intravascular or intracardiac pressure. We don't want the direct effect of the respiratory pressure. The only case we like it is when we're measuring RV, LV simultaneous recording. Anyway, so this is the, her PA pressure. And this is her RA pressure. And looking at those two, PA and RA, what's the diagnosis? Or what's the striking thing when you look at that RA pressure? There's something striking about it. A couple of striking things. Can anybody say just, I don't want you to answer the question, but it's a hard question actually. But what is the, uh, what's the striking um, thing about that RA pressure? I'll make it easier via this tracing. It's from another patient, but it's kind of the same. This one, I made it easier by showing you the line, the mean line. Dr. Hanna, is it elevated without respiratory variation? Yes. Yes, exactly. So it's an elevated pressure. That's the first thing you notice. But importantly, the mean pressure doesn't change. It's like this. If you put the mean uh, recording, it doesn't change at all. You do get some dipping, some wave dipping. And that wave, you have to recognize it. It's a Y descent, right? It comes after a V wave, OK? It's a Y descent before the A wave comes after V, it's a wide descent. So you have intermittent dipping of the wide descent, but the mean pressure is in, invariable. So what is, what is this, what is the diagnosis? Or what is this called? This is what I defined earlier that in the pressure does not change with respiration. This is what I called earlier Kuzmol sign. This is RA pressure that does not change with respiration. Now, is this, is this constrictive pericarditis? It's more with RV failure. So, so would you, what would you answer on this then? It is a tough question. Here's, here's my answer. The, the, what I want you to know is that Kuzmol sign, even though we think it is constrictive pericarditis, that's at least what all textbooks highlight. In reality, Kuzmol sign is very common with all those four. So constrictive pericarditis, restrictive cardiomyopathy, or severe RV failure. In all of them, you do get Kuzmol sign. So that invariable RA pressure, as I always highlighted to fellow when we do right heart cath on heart failure patient, we see it every day, multiple times a day on all severe right heart failure. So it is seen in constrictive pericarditis, but it's also seen in restrictive cardiomyopathy and severe right heart failure. So it's the same, same thing that you see. Mean RA pressure doesn't change. You do get dipping of the Y descent in inspiration. And I'll explain why. I, you, I understand, I think, why, you, why this happens in constrictive pericarditis. We explained it. It's because of the lack of negative, a transmission of negative pressure to the RA or to the all the cardiac chamber and inspiration. So the RA pressure doesn't change. The flow between SVC and RA may dip. So that's why you don't get a decline in inspiration. That's in constrictive pericarditis. Now, in right heart failure, it's a different mechanism. I want you to know it because I see it every single day. In right heart failure, so the inspiratory pressure gets transmitted to the RA, okay? So you take a deep breath, the inspiration gets transmitted to the RA. So the RA 
pressure should directly decline by that direct transmission. However, the RA pressure declines. So when the RA pressure declines, it's going to suck more flow. It will try to suck more flow from the SVC and IVC. It doesn't suck much because it's overwhelmed, but whatever it sucks, it's so overwhelmed and so non-compliant that its pressure will shoot up and it will compensate for the direct pressure decline. So the inspiratory pressure makes it drop, but the sucking of blood flow makes it shoot up being not so non-compliant. Eventually those two effects compensate each other and you end up with no change in RA pressure. So it tends to suck volume, which will make the pressure go up, shoot up, being non-compliant. But the direct negative, there is also direct negative pressure transmitted. The summation of those two is that the RA pressure doesn't change at all. The only thing that will change is Y descent. Why? Because Y is in the same direction as the inspiratory pressure. So the mean doesn't change because of what I explained, the two, the two opposing effect on pressure. But the Y will change because Y is, is tending down like the inspiratory pressure. So it will become deeper in inspiration because it's in the same direction as inspiration. I don't know if you understood it. Uh, if you didn't, I do go over it every time I do a right heart cath. So, uh, but you can ask me questions though. Is, is everything okay? All right, so the answer to that question is just Kuzmol sign, which could be any of the other one, but the most definite answer is Kuzmol sign. This is another case. Uh, I do have another case, but I do want to skip to something that is of importance for me. How about echo? I do want to go over echo. Uh, I do want to highlight a few things, the echo feature of constrictive pericarditis. Okay, it goes with what I explained. So in, in constrictive pericarditis, and I will highlight, this is the hepatic venous flow. So this is a normal hepatic venous flow in inspiration and expiration. This is what happened in constrictive pericarditis. Again, a hallmark of constrictive pericarditis is a dramatic respiratory variation in flow. So IVC, not SVC, IVC flow dramatically rises with inspiration it dramatically declines in expiration, much more dramatically than a normal individual. A normal individual will have respiratory variation. They are much more dramatic in constrictive pericarditis. That's the key idea in constrictive pericarditis, much more dramatic respiratory variation because of that ventricular interdependence. So this is what happens. In, in inspiration, the flow will rise and you'll have big S and D. D is bigger than S normally. That's like, in, in not normally, sorry, in constrictive pericarditis, D is usually bigger than S because Y is bigger than X, usually. Y dips more. But the important thing in expiration, you get a dramatic reversal of both S and D. And that's the hallmark of constrictive pericarditis. Dramatic D reversal, DR, in constrictive pericarditis. Okay, in restrictive cardiomyopathy, by definition, like I said, you have no preload reserve, you have no stroke volume reserve, you get very limited filling, very limited variation in flow. So actually you don't get much variation in inspiration and exp between inspiration and expiration, much even less than the normal individual gets, okay? This is another term, what we call an IVC that absolutely does not collapse with inspiration. In constrictive pericarditis, even though the IVC is dilated, it does collapse some. It may not collapse 50%, but it does collapse some. You do get variation in flow in constrictive pericarditis. You get absolutely none in the restrictive cardiomyopathy. So that D reversal is characteristic of constrictive pericarditis. And I want you to memorize it. I, I, this is just a mnemonic. Diastolic reversal, expiration, constriction. So in expiration, you get DR in diastolic reversal in constricted pericarditis. Very important. This is how we record it. You have to change your sweep speed and make it slow sweep speed. And it's nice to have a respirometer. And look grossly and compare the forward waves with the back. This is forward in hepatic vein flow. It's down. The forward flow in hepatic vein is looking down. 
So anyway, this is forward and this is backward, okay? And Mayo has quantified this is, uh, they use a ratio of uh, uh, 0.79. Anyway, I use that if that backward flow is almost equal to the forward flow, if you have that much, uh, expiratory reversal, that's very suggestive of constrictive pericarditis. So this is an, in, in expiration, look how it reverses. Whereas in inspiration, D is forward. This is D forward in inspiration. This is D backward in expiration. This is also D, okay? It's hard to tell D or S, but at least compare backward versus forward. I want to highlight a second feature of constrictive pericarditis, I think, Echo, another echo feature. I will highlight the most specific features. There are other ones, but those are the most specific. Septal behavior, okay? So again, the RV and LV, those are from real cases I've had. So again, RV and LV fight for space in constrictive pericarditis, okay? So, uh, and, and, they, and, they, and they fight for space, that's one, and second, Th that uh, they get a dramatic variation in volume and flow with respiration. So in inspiration, the RV gets a lot bigger than the LV. In expiration, the LV becomes bigger than the RV. So without necessarily analyzing systole versus diastole, I think the easiest way of doing it is get again a, um, a slow speed, sweep speed and look at the septal position, how it's varying, okay? That's one second how it's varying. Normally, you don't get that septal fluctuation, okay? The fact that you have that much septal fluctuation in position is suggestive with respiration, is suggestive of constrictive pericarditis. Now, I will compare it to RV failure. Be careful, in RV failure, it's a little different. In RV failure, you don't get much respiratory evaluation. Just one second, sorry. Uh, so my pager. So in RV failure, you don't get respiratory variation in, uh, you don't get respiratory variation in septal position. You get systole versus diastole abnormal movement. So in systole in RV failure, the septum paradox, sorry, let me hear. This is systole, okay? Okay, this is systole. Let's go to diastole. In diastole, the septum moves paradoxically toward the left ventricle. Normally, it should expand toward the right ventricle in diastole. The septum moves toward the left ventricle in diastole. In systole, the, the septum should go toward the left ventricle. Basically, the left ventricle should contract. The left ventricle, focus on those two. The left ventricle should contract and should expand here. The septum behaves opposite. It, it goes toward the RV in systole and toward the LV in diastole. This is the RV volume overload. It's not much respiratory. The septum is not changing between respiratory cycle. It's just behaving abnormally between systole and diastole. This is not the case in constrictive pericarditis. You just focus on respiration and you see the septum overall without having to analyze systole versus diastole. I used to dive into this. I think the easiest just put that respirometer and see how much the septum is varying in position. That's another illustration. Look at how the septum is varying in position, okay? And it's happening to be in diastole what's highlighting, but it doesn't matter, it's just varying, okay? This is here expiration, the LV is expanding. This is inspiration, the, RV, the LV is shrunk, the RV is expanding. Another feature, so you got everybody, so variation in septal position is constrictive pericarditis, very different from the RV failure. A second uh, M mode feature of constrictive pericarditis is what we call septal bounce. That's very different from what I just explained. So what I explained is respiratory variation in septal position. The second feature is what we call septal bounce or septal shuddering. Septal bounce means don't look at respiration. Look within each diastole. Normally you have, this is systole of the left ventricle and this is diastole. Normally in diastole, this is after T wave, you should have a straight line from this septum 
all the way to here. It's a full expansion normally. LV goes straight to expand. This is what we call septal bounce or septal shuddering. You see it very well on MMOL. It means those two ventricles are fighting for space, not just throughout respiration, but also on an instantaneous level. With every second, every, sorry, milliseconds, they are fighting for space. So that septum is hesitant. It goes back and forth. So rather than that septum going straight and expanding, you see that Im in immediate fight fighting between RV and LV. You see it better here. It goes this way, then that way, then it may go back this way, then that way. The RV and LV are instantaneously fighting for space. That's what you call septal bounce. And that's actually the thing you see, the thing you see the most and the best by your naked eye when you look at 2D view. So you see that septum dancing. And that's what you see on MO, that instantaneous variation in, in uh, movement in that septum. You see that? So this is septal shudder or septal bounce, different from the respiratory variation of septal position. So this is, those are the three echo criteria that you need to know, the most specific one. If you have two out of the three, you've made the diagnosis of constrictive pericarditis by echo. This is based on a paper uh, and other papers, but this is the most important one. So one is a respiratory septal shift on M mode, which include the two features I mentioned, uh, the septal variation and the septal shuddering. Along with either one of those, the hepatic vein reversal to flow vein uh, D over a ratio, I said over one, but the exact number they use is over 0.79. So again, this is pronounced diastolic reversal of hepatic vein. The third feature is E prime to lateral E prime. I didn't go over this, but I, you, probably most of you know it, but I'll highlight it quickly. Uh, so normally the, there is in, in heart failure and uh, restrictive cardiomyopathy, there is abnormal relaxation, okay? So E prime, which is relaxation at the lateral annulus and E prime at the medial annulus decline because there is abnormal relaxation. Uh, however, in constrictive pericarditis, the muscle is normal. So the lateral annulus is restricted though, or is constricted because of that shell. So we get the E prime relaxation of the lateral annulus declines, while the medial E prime does not decline because the, again, the muscle is normal. In fact, the muscle is so normal that it does relax and it wants to relax and it wants to fill so much so that E prime will be over normal, may be high to compensate for the depressed lateral E prime. So this is what you call annulus inversus. On the E prime, on the tissue Doppler of the annulus, medial, medial, lateral E prime is depressed, whereas medial E prime is increased. One way of quantifying this is this here, oh, sorry. Medial E prime over nine centimeter per second, or bigger than lateral E prime. Normally, e medial E prime should be less than lateral E prime consistently in normal individuals or in myocardial disease. It exceeds lateral E prime in constricted pericarditis, or it exceeds nine centimeter per second, um, along with a somewhat depressed lateral E prime. This is annulus inversus. Everybody understood this? Uh, this is a, I'll show you this and I'll finish. This is another case, again, uh, hepatic vein flow. And look here, the respiratory variation. Again, here in, in uh, expiration, you get massive reversal of flow versus inspiration. This is very suggestive of a pericardial process. Now I will make it confusing. This is actually tamponade, not constrictive pericarditis, but the devil is in the detail. In tamponade, you do get, like I said, pronounced respiratory variation as well. Uh, the only difference is that in tamponade, what you're seeing is mostly, uh, what, what you see in tamponade, you see flattening of D. So what you see pronounced is S, not D. Again, this is hard to highlight. It's really hard to distinguish S from D, in my opinion, when you're doing slow speed. Uh, so it's really hard, but just know in tamponade, D, is flat because D is Y, okay? Always remember the correlation, by the way, I will remind you that. 
S is X, S flow on hepatic vein or pulmonary vein is X on the atrial pressure. S is X, sex. D is Y. In tamponade, Y is flat, so D is flat. It is hard to discern on this tracing, but that's one of the distinguishing, distinguishing feature between tamponade constriction. Oftentimes, not very practical though, in my opinion. It's hard to tell on this recording. All you can tell on this recording is that you have a pronounced respiratory variation. You have a pronounced D reversal, and therefore it is a pericardial process. Indeed, in this case, it was a uh, uh, tamponade, okay? Uh, I, I know a lot of you has left, uh, but you can review those uh, talks. I want to show you another case for those who, can, who will review the talk. I do want to show you another case of uh, simultaneous recording of LV and RV. Uh, so this is another case. Look through it again. It can fool you if you look through the peaks. This is so. If you look through the peaks, the LV goes down and up. The RV seems to be moving simultaneously with it. It really fools you. It looks concordant. However, again, you have to take the peak inspiratory beat, which correspond to that dip. So this is a peak inspiratory beat as I highlight by the arrows, and the peak expiratory beat as I highlighted on those arrows as well. If you analyze those beats, then you see that there is discordance. This versus this. RV here is, RV pulse volume is much shrunk between those two beats, whereas the LV is, is much higher on this beat. So there is discordance, okay? So, uh, so LV high, RV low, LV low, RV high. So another thing, again, do it in order to catch this. I do have some advice to you about how to do those uh, cases. One, you have to obtain long recordings and be patient and obtain multiple recordings and keep analyzing and look for trends overall. That's one. Two, uh, ask the patient to take a deep breath. That will help make those variation more pronounced. Three, try to induce a PVC. A PVC may help you, okay? May help make things uh, clearer. So, you know, those are, I think, the idea I will highlight for you. Like here, after a PVC, it's clear that the um, RV got bigger, whereas the LV got smaller. PVC, this RV got much bigger as a bulk. Again, analyze the bulk, whereas the LV got smaller. So. Try to look for those things. It's not always easy. Uh, this is a case you can review at home, but this is a tough case. You have, I, it's hard for me to tell whether, whether there is concordance or discordance. It's just hard. And in those, and, and probably the one thing I can tell, there isn't a much respiratory variation, which by itself could indicate um, that, that it's not constrictive pericardial. It's some myocardial process that, prevent having too much respiratory variation. Uh, but again, this should have been done probably with deeper inspiration, maybe induce a PVC. That's how you, you want to make those um, RV, LV discordant pressure more pronounced to be able to analyze, okay? Because otherwise here between peak inspiration and peak expiration, I don't see much variation. Again, that by itself could be a sign of restrictive cardiomyopathy and uh, severe right heart failure where you don't have much preload reserve and you don't have much flow reserve, okay, on the Starling curve. This patient in particular had right, severe right heart failure. He wasn't constricted pericarditis, which fits with my uh, analysis. All right, uh, I think uh, this is, I'll just show this picture and I'll be done. This is a case of almost a chest X-ray fluoro. You can see that heavy, heavy calcification of the pericardium. That by itself is very suggestive of constrictive pericarditis. Uh, you don't often see heavy calcification. It's rare. You see it maybe 20% of the cases. The more uniform anatomical feature is on CT. You get pericardial thickening, 
less often calcification. You get pericardial thickening, but even that is not universal. 82% of constrictive pericarditis have pericardial thickening. And what I call pericardial thickening is a pericardium over uh, that is equal or over three millimeters on CT. It's a supportive feature. All right. I think I've lost most of you by now, but uh, I'm done. If uh, for those who are left here, are there any questions? Oh, this was excellent, Dr. Han. I, I can tell that, you know, at least in my echo board, there were at least, I can say five questions, if not, you know, more just from this talk. And this is like good. extremely important. Good, good. Well, any questions, uh, you, Roy, or anybody else? No, I think, I think we're good. I mean, this is a complex topic. I'm pretty sure people will have questions later on. Yes, please email me or call me or text me, whatever. Please contact me. I will send you the slides. I have a lot of explanation underneath the slides. I will send you my book chapter and try to re-listen to that talk uh, to consolidate. I'm sorry, I know it's very heavy, but... Uh, but no, this is very good. This is very good. All right. <laughs> we had this lecture before we gave our echo boards. That's oh, what me and good. Fani were talking about. Oh, good. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for attending. Okay? Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.